great. I'd like to invite Pastor Rob and Kelly up front. Come on up. Dawn of a new day. As a search committee, we felt called to look for an outreach pastor. And someone in the search committee, after we interviewed both of them, said, never in a thousand years could we find someone who would be so good for this church. So we're just really honored. We're just really honored to be able to collaborate with, uh, with Rob and, and Kelly. Um, the Lord's called them from a successful ministry back in Oklahoma, and they've left family back there. Yeah, you can see the picture of the lovely, lovely family. And they just feel called to Santa Cruz and feel called to serve among us. So our objective here is to, to build up the kingdom of God. And uh, I just really look forward to collaborating together with Rob and Kelly and uh, bringing the kingdom of God to, to Santa Cruz. You might want to hold that pause until after the sermon. <laughs> Because if the sermon goes awry, you have just wasted the clap. <laughs> Kelly and I could not be more thankful for the opportunity to come to Santa Cruz and serve the Lord here. And then for the Lord to open this door for us to become part of Santa Cruz Community Church is overwhelming. And we are so grateful to the pastor search committee, to the leadership council. God has shown us that he is miraculously moving and we get to be part of this. And it is so special. You can turn in your Bibles if you want to Hebrews chapter 12, verses one through three. If you're struggling where it is in the Bible in front of you, in the green Bible in front of you, it's on page 1816. I've entitled this sermon this morning, Running the Race. Does anyone know what this weekend is? This coming weekend, for a few people around here, it's the wharf to wharf. But there's something a little bigger going on in our world than the wharf to wharf. It's called the Olympics. It's my favorite sporting events, of, and it only comes around every four years. But this Friday, July 26th of 2024, marks the opening ceremonies of the 2024 Summer Olympic Games held in Paris, France. 329 events in 32 different sports. Can you just remember some of the greats that have gone before us in this competition? I think of Jim Thorpe, Wilma Rudolph, Mark Spitz, Carl Lewis, Mary Lou Retton, Karch Karai was one of my favorites. Florence Griffith Joyner, another of my favorite, a former Baylor Bear, Michael Johnson. Do you remember what Michael was famous for? His gold shoes. <laughs> he ran the 400. The 1992 Dream Team, and most currently Simone Biles. A little trivia question. Does anyone know the most decorated Olympian of all time? He's a kid from California named Michael Phelps. Michael Phelps. What's your favorite event? Like, there are so many to choose from, from gymnastics to wrestling for Mr. Styles in the back corner to the equestrian to so many events we don't even know of. Mine personally is watching the swimming and watching the basketball. 
But there are so many other parts of it as well. You have just the patriotism. You have the singing of the national anthems. You have the chanting. You have the uniforms. Like they take so much pride in their uniforms and what they're wearing. There are just so many layers to the Olympics with the underdog countries. Well, that's happening starting this weekend. I want to dive into the word. As I was praying what the Lord would have me to preach on for the first Sunday at Santa Cruz Community Church, I thought of a number of different passages and the Lord brought me back to what I would call my life verse. And so this verse means everything to me. And so if you want to know who I am, um, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 will tell you a lot about me. Let's read. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. To understand this passage written by the author of Hebrews, you kind of have to get back to their time, their context. I will call it their arena. Did you know that the ancient Olympic Games started in 776 B.C.? 776 B.C. So at the time of the writing of the book of Hebrews, they had had 800 years of the Olympic Games held in Olympia, Greece. Fascinating. You were allowed to compete if you could speak the language of Greek. Any athlete from around the ancient world could go and compete in the Olympic Games if they could speak the language of Greek. The first event ever in the Olympic Games was called the Stadion Race. S-T-A-D-I-O-N Race. They marked a beginning and they marked an ending and someone walked um, 200 paces and that marked the length of the race. I thought the original race was the marathon, but that is incorrect. It is the stadium race. And you know what's amazing? They built their original stadiums around the length of that marking. And so when you go back to ancient Greece, when you go to ancient Israel, you see a stadium and its marking is based on that from 776 BC. They did not give gold, silver, and bronze medals at the original races in ancient Greece. They gave olive branches made in the form of a wreath. And that was the crown for the champion. That was presented by the emperor who would sit at the mark of the finish line. That's the context with which we're reading in Hebrews 12. So their arena, look at verse 1. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, that was their arena. 
And can you just picture this great throng of witnesses with thousands upon thousands, so numerous you couldn't even count this great cloud of witnesses. But I hope you noticed that the author in Hebrews uses the word witnesses, not spectators. This cloud of witnesses had personally witnessed the truth. They personally have experienced the faith that has been written for in the previous chapter of Hebrews 11. And so you see this throng of witnesses whose faith had been placed in the right thing. And they were witnesses to the truth. And so verse 1, Therefore, since we have been surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, let us run the race. And if you see this passage, this passage is speaking to what I would call the thesis of this chapter. Run with endurance the race marked out for us. The key word in this chapter is the word endure. It's found in verse 1, verse 2, verse 3, verse 7, and verse 20. And the word literally means in the Greek to bear up under trial, to continue when the going is tough. And if any of you have ever ran in a race, you know that it takes endurance. It takes the ability to push through when the going is tough. These Christians in this time when the writer of Hebrews penned this book were going through a time of testing. They were tempted to give up. They wanted to quit. And the author writes, Run this race with perseverance. My first thing that I want to challenge us with this morning is how do I run? How do I run? Since we're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, let us run with endurance the race marked out for us. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. So the first thing we see here is it takes preparation. You cannot show up and run a race without preparation. It doesn't work. You see these Olympians. They give their entire life to prepare for their race, their sport. They sacrifice from early childhood. They sacrifice and give up for the gymnasts. These gymnasts will move to Houston, Texas, away from their families, and they will give their life to prepare. And you see that in so many of the different sports. It takes preparation to run the race. And the author tells us two things about this preparation. Number one, we need to throw off what hinders us in the race. We need to throw off what hinders us in the race. And as you see that, you might say, well, that's all about sin. But he will define that here in the second point. But this first point, what hinders us in the race? And I would say, worry hinders me. I would say anxiety can hinder us. I would say fear can cripple us. I would say just being lackadaisical can keep me from shedding the weight that I need to do when I'm running this race. In Mark chapter 10, verses 49 through 52, I would love to read this passage to you. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called to this blind man, cheer up on your feet. He's calling you. 
Look at the blind man's response. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and he came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. You see what this blind man did? He removed his cloak and he came and followed Jesus. Do you know what some of us need to do this morning in our race that has been prepared for us? We try to play the game in warm-ups or we ply, try to play the game in clothes that aren't fit for us. If we want to run this race, let's be clothed correctly and let's throw off the things that are hindering us. And then point number two, let's throw off the sin that is entangling us. That sin can get along our feet and can trip us up in the race. Has anger ever tripped you up in your race? Has bitterness ever tripped you up in your race? How about unforgiveness? The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, those things can entangle us and trip us up and keep us from being able to run the race that was marked out for us. The second part of how do I run this race is just a beautiful part. Since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so entangles and let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. If we want to run this race, we need to do what these ancient runners in the stadium race would do. They would, at the start of the finish line, they would fix their eyes upon the emperor sitting at the finish line. And they would run solely focused on the prize. For us, that is fixing our eyes on Jesus. You know what's amazing? You have this great cloud of witnesses. You have Noah and Abraham, Moses, David. You have Rahab and so many others that are mentioned among these witnesses. You would think that as we were running our race, our eyes might get up on some of those great heroes of the faith. And God does not share his glory with anyone. These runners are fixing their eyes on Jesus Christ, who has already run this race of faith, and he conquered it for us. Jesus Christ is the author. That means he's the pioneer. He's the trailblazer. And then he's the finisher of our faith. He's both the alpha and the, the omega. He's the beginning and the end. What he starts, he finishes. If he has started this race in your life, he is going to finish it. He is going to. To finish it. And then let's look at verse 3. Consider him. Who endured such opposition. From, sim, sim, from sinful men. So that you will not grow weary. And lose heart. These words are such a secret. Of encouragement. And strength. When the race gets difficult. I don't know if you have experienced this in your journey, in your race that you have been running for however many years of your life. The race gets hard. There are seasons when you want to give up and just quit and say, Lord, I've run as much as I can. I don't think I can take another step. And he goes, consider this. Jesus Christ 
endured such opposition from sinful men, can we just stop and ponder for a second what he endured? He was slandered. He was spat upon. He was mocked. He was beaten from sinful men so that we in our race will not grow weary, will not lose heart. And so that can be an encouragement to us. I want to bring one point into this this morning. And if there's anything that you hear, I hope that you hear this part. I am a former teacher and a basketball coach. I taught for 17 years and I coached basketball in the great state of Texas, mainly in Dallas. And then we moved to the state of Oklahoma and I coached in the Oklahoma City area for eight years. I am an extremely competitive person. Is there anyone else in here that's an extremely competitive person and that will actually confess that? <laughs> Many times it is a great trait and oftentimes it turns into a sin. I don't like to lose to my children in anything. I will not let them win. I will play cards with some dear friends who are here today. And even though they are very old, I will still try to beat them. Let me read you this about competition. It's important to see that the competition of the Christian life is different from that competition in an athletic race. First of all, we're not competing against other Christians. We're not trying to outdo each other in righteousness or recognition or accomplishments. Our church isn't trying to be better than another church. Me personally, I am not trying to look better than you in my Christian walk. Our race is not a race of works. It's a race of faith. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For it is by grace that you have been saved, through faith. That is not from yourselves. It is a gift from God, not by works, so that no man can boast. Yet we do not compete with each other, even in faith. We compete by faith, but not with each other. Our competition is against Satan, his world system, and against his creation of trying to get us off of our race. And then secondly, our competition is against our own flesh. Also, our strength is not in ourselves in this race. Our strength comes from the power and the filling of the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, we could never endure when it gets tough. We're not called to endure in and of ourselves but we are called to endure in Him. And we have only one way to endure. It's by faith. We're called to be filled with the Spirit. And when we are, our focus, we will fix our eyes on Jesus Christ. And when our eyes are focused unwaveringly on the Lord, then the Holy Spirit has a beautiful, perfect opportunity to use us, to get us to running and to get us to winning. I want us to consider three questions as a point of application this morning. First of all, am I in the race or am I more like a spectator? There is nothing wrong for us to question before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords Am I in the race? It is a good and healthy thing for even us who have been in the faith for years and years to ask the Lord, Lord, am I running the race that you have marked out? Or am I one who sits in the stands and hears all about your word? I go to your services. I do these things. 
but I'm not in the race. And so the first question this morning is, have you exercised the faith of receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? And if you haven't, I would encourage you with all of your heart, beg of the Lord to save you and to put you in this race. Then the second question this morning, in the race that has been marked out for me, what is hindering my ability to run? Again, this is a question to look deep into your own heart. And as I have pondered this verse throughout my life, he shows me when anxiety is dragging me down. He shows me when trying to perform and receive the praise of men instead of the praise of God would drag me down. What is hindering you in your run? And then finally, what is entangling your ability to run? Ask the Lord to reveal sin into your heart and say, God, where is it that I am not living this pure and holy life and show me what I need to get rid of and throw off? Then the third question this morning is, where is my focus? Where is my focus? Am I fixated upon Jesus Christ? Or am I looking at my clothes? Or am I looking in the stands? Or how about this one? Am I looking around at the other competitors? Any good runner knows, if you are not fixed upon the finish line, you will not run well. And so where is my focus? I would like to point us to Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6, another of my favorite verses. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of our partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. You know what that says to me? When I was a nine-year-old boy in Borger, Texas, at First Baptist Borger, Texas, the Lord convicted me. And He showed me my sin and I confessed to Him that I was a sinner and that I needed Jesus. And I received the Holy Spirit and He changed my life. And I've been running that race ever since. Many days I stumble. Many days I fall. I'll have seasons where I get injured and I get put on the sideline. And by God's grace, He heals me. And I'm back in the race running. But I can be confident of this. He who began a good work in me at First Baptist Border, Texas in 1975, He will carry it to completion until the day of Christ. I want to close with this one thing. This day, this past week, is a day I will never forget. Getting to come here and serve at Santa Cruz Community Church, God has marked this time and this week, and it has been so special. So from the first day of me getting to run this race, the Lord willing, He will use me as I partner in running with you and we can run together. This past week, I've looked into the history of the First Baptist Church of Santa Cruz, California. For those of you who it's your first time here, this church is rich. This church is so rich. I found this article in the newspaper from the 130th celebration the First Baptist Santa Cruz. You can find it online. It's a great read. And then Glenn gave me the uh, exact words that were in it. Let me just read a few things. And let me put it in context with this morning. First Baptist Church, Santa Cruz, California, established in 1858 and it's still serving under the original charter 
from 1858. That's 166 years of faithfully running this race that has been marked out for us. I see a great cloud of witnesses who have gone before us, the pioneers. It reads, on October 24th, 1858, a small group of Baptists met at Rice Hall in Santa Cruz for the purpose of organizing a Baptist church here. Reverend C.N. West was called that same day as the first pastor. What a pioneer. What a pioneer. They started this for us. This that we're in today, they started for us. They struggled for years to get a building. Then finally, Deacon Lawrence Pollard donated a lot of land on the original church building was finished in June of 1867. Y'all, that's two years after the Civil War was finished. Listen to this. On the hill. At Locust and Mission. I'm looking forward to driving over there and seeing where the Lord began His work at Santa Cruz Community Church. I'll keep going. In the summer of 1887, that's 1887. In the summer, Byron, you will love this part. A feat of engineering for that day was accomplished when the church building was raised. They lifted the foundation and they moved the church down the hill with a team of horses to Walnut Avenue. For many years, the church was known as the Traveling Church. <laughs> Since the very beginning of the church, it's been involved in community projects, in local outreach, in establishing and supporting missions. You know what one of their mission churches was? Twin Lakes. What a rich history. Our heritage as part of the American Baptist Churches of the United States of America comments President Pastor William Nolte. The marks of us as a people dedicated to missions and outreach. This continues today with our concern for and involvement in local concerns. We also remain in touch with the larger picture through church members serving in Zaire and our participation in national and international missions of our denomination. Historically, we've been dedicated to serving in our community, to evangelism, to missions, and that commitment remains strong. Y'all ready for this one? That's where we're running to. The race hasn't changed. We want to run to outreach in our community. And we want to show them the love of Christ. And we don't want to be single-minded here. We want to take the gospel to the nations. And though you're back home, we still have families that this church supports all around the world for the gospel of Jesus Christ. At that point, 29 pastors had served this First Baptist congregation over 130 years, the Reverend William Nolte said, it's a great honor to be called to such a historic congregation to a wonderful area like Santa Cruz. A young pastor is not all that common, but I believe states rather clearly the intention of this church to be a place for families, children, and people of all ages. And God made that happen. Allowing for just a little bias, my partnership with the associate pastor, John Heverling, and the faithful people of this church makes for a great place where people feel welcome, cared for, and needed. This was written 36 years ago. 
With God's blessing, that's what this church is all about. I was talking with Albert yesterday, and I said, Albert, how did God draw you to Santa Cruz Community Church? And he said, they were doing a Bible study, and I walked into, do you mind that I'm sharing this? I moved to Santa Cruz, and I, I knew that I needed a church family. And I knew it needed to be grounded on the Word of God. And I walked into this Bible study, and there was this 89-year-old man named John Heberly who was teaching the Word of God faithfully at the age of 89 with throat cancer. And you know what Albert said? That's the kind of church I want to be a part of. You know what Kelly and I experienced that Saturday morning when we met with the pastor search committee? With Dottie, with Gail, with Steve, with Jerry, with Glenn, with CJ, and with Margaret. And we went around the room, and these two godly women who have been here for years and years and years, and they are on the pastor search committee? You're the kind of people that we want to serve the Lord with. Because do you know what I see from you two women? You are running the race. And you may say, you don't know how old I am. I can't run anymore. And you know what I would say to you? That is so false. You two sisters are running the race in a way that all of us would wish that we could be able to run when we're your age. And God used you two women to help Kelly and me figure out where we need to be running. And I just want to thank you two for that, personally, with all my heart. And so, we run this race. We throw off everything that hinders. We could be cheering and celebrating all of these great heroes of the faith at Santa Cruz Community Church who have gone before us, but you know what? That wouldn't be biblical. We need to fix our eyes on Jesus Christ. We need to be grateful for the history and we need to fixate on the author and the perfecter of our faith. So as we close this morning, would you commit with Kelly and me, let's run. Let's run together. And let's see where God is going to take us. We don't need a new vision. The vision was written in our history. Let's go reach out to the community. Let's go reach out to the nations and let's share the love of Christ with them. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for this time this morning. Father, thank you that your word is good and true and rich. And Father, thank you that you, the creator of this world, the author and the perfecter of our faith, would invite us to run with you. Father, that is just too much. But Father, we thank you that you love us this much, that you would let us be a part of this history. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you.